So hello everyone, this is uh, Rich Bradway call, um, uh, from the Boston Symphony Orchestra and we're here today to talk about Henry which is the uh, online performance history database for the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Um, to give you some context, Henry is named after the founder of the BSO, Henry Lee Higginson. Um, the premise of this presentation is to give you uh, a little demo of, of the application as well as to give a technology overview of what uh, sort of the underpinnings of the application to give you context and then possibly um, give, you know, by giving this presentation we hope that others will take the opportunity and utilize the source code from this application to utilize it for their own needs. Um, and uh, we'll be happy to answer questions throughout the uh, presentation. I thought first what we would do is just go through and introduce a few people here. Um, so I am Rich Bradway. I'm the Associate Director of E-Commerce and New Media for the Boston Symphony Orchestra. We have Himanshu Vakil here as well. Uh, he's the BSO Web Application and Security Lead. We also have on the line David Boland who is the primary web developer of this application. He works for Adage Technologies. And we also have Roshan Tanukar, who's the lead developer over at Adish Technologies. And we have a surprise guest, and that is uh, Bridget Carr, who is the BSO archivist with us today. So thank you, everyone, for taking the time to uh, be on this uh, call slash webinar. Um, what I'll first do is sort of just give an overview of Henry as well as a, a, a brief demo of the application so you can get a sense of uh, what our business case was to motivate us to have Henry as well as to give a context of what Henry is. And then after that, uh, I'll be handing over the reins of the presentation to Adage as well as to Hamanshu to talk more about the technical uh, underpinnings of the application. So uh, in regards to the business case, um, the BSO has performance data for over 20,000 performances in its 133-year uh, history. Um, this data is housed in an application called OPAS, which is a, better, it's, it's a short acronym for Orchestra Planning and Administration Systems. This application is um, accessed by a number of departments within the organization, but primarily it would be the uh, orchestra personnel, artistic management, archives, and that's predominantly it, isn't it? Or maybe and even production. And even and production. Library. Production and library. So um, we have a number of different departments that access this data. Uh, over the course of each month, we will get dozens of inquiries regarding performance information. And although it's pretty easy to access this information in OPAS, um, OPAS contains a lot of information we don't necessarily one, want to make available to the public. Uh, and you know, it, it, even though it's easy, it does involve some time. And depending on who is contacting who within the organization, it can take longer or shorter. Uh, so what we wanted to do was come up with a way to search this data quickly to be able to filter out the confidential information and preferably do it in such a way so that it would be a web-based interface so that people, external constituents, could access it at any time and perform searches as quickly and seamlessly as possible. Uh, parallel to that, we also have um, over 8,000 program books for the 20,000, over 20,000 performances uh, in our history. And one of the things that we did over the course of the last few years is that we received a grant from the National, National Endowment for the Humanities to digitize uh, these 8,000 program books and to archive them on the Internet Archive at archive.org as well as uh, the BSO's Content DM service uh, which is located at collections.bso.org. Uh, Content DM is basically a digital collection management software so it's kind of like a dam but it's predominantly geared towards um, archives and libraries yeah. and, academi and academia. Is that the proper word? Um, so one of the things that we wanted to do so that it would be easier to access these program books was to marry our performance history database 
uh, and link when applicable uh, the program books to the performances that get returned in the performance history database. So our project plan was to take OPAS, the performance history uh, application, marry it with ContentDM, and marry it with BSO.org, which was the corporate website of the BSO, to produce Henry. Um, part of the project of uh, creating Henry was also funded by the, the Sloan Foundation. And one of the things that they want us to do was to uh, develop the application in a way that we'd be utilizing a framework and code base that could be granted to other organizations free of cost to produce a similar application for their needs. So if you're an organization that uses OPAS, um, then it's probably one of the easiest things that you can build because it's, everything's derived from the, the data structure of OPAS. However, we've abstracted a lot of that information out, and as long as you have a good uh, database person, um, it shouldn't take a monumental effort to be able to create something similar usually utilizing this same uh, framework. So what I'll do now is I'll just do a quick application walkthrough of Henry, and then afterwards I'll, I'll open it up to any questions about the application, um, and then we'll go into some of the more technical stuff. So this is Henry. Um, if you go to archives.bso.org, this is the way you would get into the application. Um, provide some expository information about Henry in terms of what exactly is captured within Henry in terms of the performance history database. And we also provide uh, a help page in terms of getting access to how the application works and some, and some insights to making searches easier. But as you can see right now, uh, we have three primary search uh, opportunities. One is a performance search. The second is an artist search. And the third is a repertoire search. So artists being any artist that performs with the BSO, Boston Pops, Tanglewood, um, and the repertoire search being the, the piece of music that we are performing uh, within our, our, our history. So what I'll do is uh, first show you the uh, application from a performance search uh, point of view. Uh, we have what's called a basic search that covers things such as composer, work, conductor, orchestra ensemble, soloist, and then the start and end date for performances. We also have additional criteria that you can pass in, such as season, instrument, arranger, event, venue, city, country, um, and then the type of premiere or the type of commission, being a world, American, Boston, New York premiere, or commission being any number of commissions that we have uh, throughout our organization. When you search on something, so for example, if I start typing in, beat, uh, it'll provide me with a context and I can select Ludwig von Beethoven. Um, I can actually then put in something as simple as 9, not 98, uh, and then I can actually put in a start and end date. And since we go back to 1881, I will start with September 1st, 1881, and I will end with September 1st, and we'll say 19... We'll say 1904, and when I hit search, it'll show me all the performances that we performed of Beethoven with the number nine in the work. And as you can see, it returns not only symphony number it returns symphony number seven because it's Opus 92, uh, and then symphony number eight because it's Opus 93. But then you also see symphony number nine. And then you can see that we have uh, 178 performances uh, that involve Beethoven with the number nine in the work. If I wanted to, I can actually filter the results. And for example, if I wanted to, I could go in here and filter it down to symphony number nine. And now it's filtered down to 17 performances of, symphony, of Beethoven symphony number nine. If you went back in here, you might also notice that um, there are other instances of Symphony Number no. 9 in the sense that we played actually the first movement, the second movement, or the third movement. But in this case, I'll just choose the complete symphony. 
And as you go down, you can see how the results are returned. And this is sort of our most basic uh, um, presentation of the result sets. It provides us with context of the date of the performance, the season, the composer work, the soloist and instrument, uh, the conductor, the orchestra, the venue, and then uh, a magnifying glass to see more details. Or if, if available, you can actually look at a program book. And I'll just scroll down here to something like um, we'll just choose this one here. So in here, I can see more details in terms of um, who is the conductor, the venue, the location, uh, some notes uh, about uh, the performance. So in this case, this performance on uh, April 27, 1900 was the final open rehearsal in the Boston Music Hall. Um, other things I can do is if I wanted to, I can click on this View Program Book. And we, this, will, this will actually link over to our collections.bso.org. Um, collections.bso.org is just a nice subdomain alias for this much more convoluted uh, URL. But as you can see in, in, in our collections, you can then look at the program. And you can... You can actually download uh, the uh, program book, or if you wanted to, you could even print it out. And what I found interesting here was this nice little piece um, about Steinway pianos uh, and how that they build pianos for Tsar Nicholas II of Russia and all these others well before uh, World War I broke out and some of them uh, were no longer in, in uh, no longer governing. The other thing that we've done is that a part of the this, this scanning is that you can actually, it also does OCR, so you can actually extract the text right from the, uh, the uh, PDF. I'm going to just show you um, an example now of, so if I did a search on Harbison, And if I wanted to, I could actually come in here and see world premieres of John Harbison by the BSO. And now it'll show me every uh, world premiere that we did of uh, John Harbison. One other thing that, some other things that we can do uh, when we're searching on stuff is, for example, if I wanted to, I can share the search. So if I click on this link, I can then send it to myself or to anybody. Uh, and what it will do is it'll send a link. Uh, to the search, which they can then in turn take and uh, put in a browser, and that will bring up the search as if they were looking at the exact same uh, search results as, as I am right now. Alternatively, if I wanted to, I can also export this search result to Excel, and I can just say And now, if I wanted to, I can. All these are now stored in an Excel spreadsheet. With respect to an artist search, uh, artist search is a little bit more simple uh, in the sense that I can just simply look for an artist. So in this case, I'll look for. Um, we'll try Yo-Yo Ma. And in, in this search, I'm just going to use uh, performances by Yo-Yo Ma since 2000. And so here, I can see um, all the performance that Yo-Yo Ma has done with the BSO or Boston Pops or Tanglewood since September 1st, 2000. Right, and everything is grouped um, by uh, composer and repertoire. Uh, if I were to click on one of these numbers, so for example, if I wanted to, I could click on uh, the uh, John Williams Hartwood for Cello and Orchestra. And this will tell me the performance, give me details, and it will bring me back whoops, to this performance uh, search to show me the information about the details. And I can further look in here to see what else was performed that day. Um, and I can see that it was performed at the shed at Tanglewood. So it's, it's a nice little way to sort of uh, cross-reference your searches. The repertoire search is, is similar to the art search. So in this case, um, I will do um, 
a search on Tandun, and I will type in map, and I'll choose the Concerto for Cello and Orchestra, and I can hit search. And it'll show me that we have performed Tandun's The Map six times. And if I want to, I can click on here, and it will show me the six times that we performed that piece of music. Uh, the other things that we can do um, is, for example, if, you, if you're a person who likes to look and search a lot, but then you don't remember what you did, you can actually come back to your search history, and it'll show you all the searches that you performed within your section, so that uh, you can easily go back and, and see that information. So, for example, if I wanted to go back to the John Harbison um, world premieres, I can do that fairly easily. And that is essentially um, the application in a nutshell. I know I kind of ran through that very quickly, but if anyone has any questions, uh, by all means, um, let me know, and we'll we'll answer them. And then before, and then we'll go into the technical uh, part of the the uh, presentation. So, are there any questions so far? Uh, this is James from Carnegie Hall. Hi, James. So I'm going to have to jump off this call in about 15 minutes. We have a, a large on sale happening that we need to be monitoring. But, uh, so I don't want to miss the te technical portion, but I have a technical question. Uh, are, are, are you searching OPAS directly, or did you say you, you created a process that migrates that data to another location and you joins it with your, your digital Sure. Access? So what we're doing, this actual application is all hitting a Microsoft uh, SQL database. So what we've done is we worked with OPAS, uh, specifically with Tom Gatons at OPAS, who developed a utility that will export uh, the database to an XML file. And then we take that XML file and through a, uh, an automated process, we ingest that file into the application, which then maps all the data to the database directly. And then what we're doing is hitting the database. So as we update OPAS with information, we have to extract uh, that information to that XML file. Cool. So on uh, um, some sort of interval, you, you refresh the data? I'm sorry? Uh, on some sort of regular interval, do you refresh the data? Is that a nightly? It's, 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 it's either a regular interval or if, uh, you know, what we do oftentimes is that as we're adding in content, say we have a batch of volunteers that are helping us with putting in uh, content from the archives uh, after they've done a, a, a large batch of content entry into OPAS and we've done the QA on that, that data, we'll then, uh, we can do it on demand and, and pull that data manually. Cool. That's, uh, I think that's another question I have now. Anyone else have any questions about the application itself? Well, guys, you guys are real easy. So um, I will now just quickly um, go into the project prerequisites right now, and um, I'll let Himanshu just speak quickly about this, and then we'll jump into uh, um, an overview of the application. Okay. So go ahead. So the prerequisite for, um, for this application to run in your environment is you would need a uh, Windows Server, um, .NET Platform, uh, Microsoft Visual Studio, and SQL Studio, uh, SQL Server um, to uh, support this application. Um, we have a data flow. Sure, we'll, we'll hand that over to, to Adage. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to hand this over to Adage. Who would I? Who should I give it to? To um, Rashawn, should I give it to you, or I'll just I'll stop showing my screen. Okay. Yeah, I can I can take the presenter. Okay, so I stopped. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is Rashawn from Adis Technologies. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So. Uh, <coughs> What we've done is we've put together a process flow 
to go over the application and uh, Dave is going to cover the details of each component. Uh, but from the high level, as Rich mentioned earlier, the application has been compartmentalized into the OPAS component and what we are calling is an importer, uh, the archive database, that's the SQL server, and then the web application. Um, the whole application is built around the intention of being scalable and extensible. Each one of these components can be easily replaced with uh, what your, your organization currently has with a minimal modification to the application. So if your organization is currently using OPAS, then XML file can be exported in the similar format that we are receiving. Uh, if not, you have two different possibilities. You can either create an XML file that conforms to the same schema or provide a custom data source. The first approach is going to require some configuration changes on the external data source, but the application will not require any changes. Uh, with the second approach, you will need to make a no, kind of data source. You will need to make a similar kind of modifications to the application, but at the same time, all you have to change will be the importer. That's uh, with the with the assumption that the backend database is going to stay the same. Uh, similarly, like we mentioned, the archive database is in the SQL Server. But if you or your organization wants to use something different, then you can use, say, for an example, MySQL. Uh, that's going to require a little more work because that the archive database is in the center of everything. So you will have to change the importer process to feed in the data and then the web application that's going to take the data out. So that's going to be a little more significant amount of work. But again, you know, that's again like a compart compartmentalized component and you can change it as per your requirement. On the web application side, um, again, Dave's going to cover more and then in depth uh, about the details. But how we have created this web application is we've Instead of accessing the data from the archive database right away, we have an interface uh, which we are calling the data transfer objects. So regardless of what kind of database you have on the back end, if you are going to provide the objects in a, in a form that the data transfer objects are in, it's going to minimize the changes on the web application. So in a way, the web application can be agnostic of the backend system that you are you have in place. Uh, the other part of the application is the content DM. Uh, it's a uh, if you remember, Rich mentioned that this is a this is a marriage between the OPAS system and then the content DM and BSO. So all of these things come together in here. From the web application, you can actually go to the content DM and. Uh, uh, this application has been built around to support most frequent searches and and uh, business rules and requirements around BSO, but that doesn't mean it cannot be customized. And there's uh, the way we the whole intention has been to make sure that other organizations can use this application with minimal minimal modification. Um, with that, I'm going to let Dave speak about about different components and then go into the technical details. OK, so just go through this process for real quick. Um, as Richie Manchu both mentioned. James, I saw a question about uh, how do we link to the content DM. And uh, the way we are doing it is uh, this is something that Rich demonstrated earlier. So there is a hyperlink. So basically, when, when, the, when the OPAS content is updated, you can actually add one of the information in there. That's the program ID for each program. And then we use that program ID to hyperlink the content DM uh, to the contents on the content DM system. So just to, just to reiterate, so what we're doing is in OPAS, we're putting the program ID for the program book uh, for that corresponding performance in OPAS so that when it gets extracted, uh, into the XML, we have that information accessible to us. And then in the application, we're, we're using that to build the URL to take us to the collections.bso.org website or the content DM website. Great. Thanks, guys. Dave? Okay. So um, just going through this process flow again real quick, as Rich and, Manchu, uh, Rich and Roshan both mentioned that um, 
we initially get the XML from a script that OPAS provides. And once we have the XML file itself, we run it to the importer. What the importer does is it goes and it parses each of the nodes in the XML, and it builds tables within the database that represent the different nodes. And those correspond to um, the events, artists, composers, works, and any additional field that the XML provides. <coughs> Once the uh, importer finishes running, the database is filled with these different tables. Then we run a stored procedure. And what that stored procedure does is it builds two tables, event detail and artist detail tables. And what those are, those are pretty much a, um, are the tables that are meant to centralize all the data that's within the separate tables to provide more efficient searching from the web application. So when the web application actually performs a search, it sends a request to the web server. And then the web server sends a data request to the archive database. Then it returns information from those event or artist detail tables back to the web server. And then they respond back to the um, browser. And from there, the browser processes all that data. and uh, display that for the user, as Rich demonstrated earlier. And then, as um, was mentioned, we could submit a link to the content DM. And go through the, the code um, overview, just to, to go over some of the projects that are within the, the Visual Studio solution here. The uh, VSO archive business objects here, this project is the uh, main importer itself. Um, we also have uh, this BSO archive DTOs. And as uh, Roshan mentioned, these provide um, a way to customize the data from the database uh, to be displayed in the browser itself, which is just another um, way to, as he said, isolate the um, isolate the actual way the data is formatted on the database uh, from the way it's displayed on the, the browser. And then we have the web application itself. So just so you can see the, the import process itself, the, what the importer does is it reads from the XML file. And then it goes through um, this whole process of parsing the XML, as I said, into storing the, the data in the different tables in the database. And within this business objects project, this is where if you have um, different business requirements than what are uh, provided, then you could update these files to um, parse the XML in whichever way uh, you require if your XML is in a different format than uh, the one that OPAS provides. And then from that point, once it's on the database, we have the, uh, the web application itself. And in here, you'll find the, the different pages, the help pages, the, the details page that uh, you saw earlier, and the different uh, search tabs within the search itself. And what happens here is when the web application um, makes a, runs a search, It'll pull IDs from the event and artist detail tables. And then from there, the web application will use JavaScript to take those IDs. And it'll call the web services here. And what it'll do is it'll get the, get the, the information based on those IDs. And then it'll use the data transfer objects to customize that data to be displayed for the user. And then it'll return that, that data to um, the JavaScript to the browser. And using that JavaScript in Backbone, we could format the data to be displayed. And we could also um, provide the other functionality you saw, such as the, the sorting and filtering. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Himanshu now. And he's going to talk more about um, the actual getting of the project, the code, and the documentation.
He's going to hand it over to you. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. This is Himanshu Vakil from Boston Symphony Orchestra. Uh, what I'm going to do is to show you how you can um, get the source code and uh, proceed with the source code and to the point where you can um, deploy it to your in your environment. The source code is released under the GNU uh, GPL version 2 license, so it's available in open source. So right now we have it uh, available through GitHub repository. Uh, to access that uh, source code, you would need to go to github.com and I would say search for Henry Archives that brings you back uh, to the search results with um, all the project files and uh, documentation that you would need. Typically, you would download as a zip file, and once you uh, download as a zip file, extract the files uh, in, in within the project uh, to kind of uh, uh, obtain all the source code. Uh, I'll show you a couple of locations where we have put the project files. So within, and uh, you go and navigate to business object project. Under that, there is a project uh, files, and we have got the archive documentation as well as sample XML uh, that we have provided to get you kind of start started with uh, seed data just in case you wouldn't have access to OPAS or you need to see the structure of the data that you would need. I'll go quickly through the documentation. Um, basically, it's a very exhaustive documentation that we have put together um, where we uh, give you an architectural overview and talk about the system requirements that we talked about earlier. We also go through step-by-step -step process of um, installing, compiling the code, building the code, publishing to your web server, and then be able to configure your web configs as well as uh, other properties on the uh, on the application, and then go through the process of data import. And we also have added a couple of uh, uh, sections on data update and da updating additional fields. So as you use the application in future, you need to update data or you have additional fields in the OPAS. How would you go ahead, uh, go about uh, adding those information uh, or modifying uh, the code to uh, accept new data? So once you uh, basically this uh, kind of outlines your document, um, <clears throat> we have the again as I said, the architectural overview, the screenshots of uh, various uh, sections that you would be working uh, to get the projects up and running, uh, including the steps and, and, and the publishing process. Uh, I'll show you how it looks. Kind of Dave mentioned about it, and I kind of briefly reiterate the same process. Uh, basically, everything is available in Stu Visual Studio. Once you import, you build that uh, project file, uh, solutions rather. And then once you go into BSO Archive Business Object and get to the properties, under Settings, you will see all the different settings that you need to change to configure to your uh, environment, uh, including the path that you would have to have for uh, your XML, the the email uh, template location and, and, and the uh, other uh, IP addresses and uh, port numbers that you may have to enter. Also, you would have to modify the web config file to meet your requirements uh, for the uh, in your for your environment. So we have web config file that you will be updating prior to um, running the application. So that's in a nutshell uh, how you would move from downloading the application from uh, source code from GitHub through the process of uh, uh, installing and running the application in your environment is a very brief overview and we have documented everything in, in, in the documentation and definitely if you have any questions as you are proceeding with this application and installing uh, you're welcome to contact us and we can help you with uh, answering those questions. And with so that, I hand it back over to me. To you, Rich. Yeah. I'm make you presenter. Uh, I think you just uh, open up that red, and then say stop showing screen. Or, and then can uh, Rashawn or Dave just give it to me for a second? Yep. All right. So, um, if anybody has any questions, 
Obviously, we can answer them now, but in the future, if you have questions or you want to know more about the application, by all means, feel free to contact us. Uh, probably the best way to contact us right now is via email. Um, if you have any particular questions about um, uh, about our archives, by all means, reach out to our archives. Bridget will be more than happy to answer you. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that part of this application, we also developed a widget so that we could embed it within our corporate website. So even though archives.bso.org is actually housed on the same server as our corporate website, we're utilizing it in a different space. Uh, but given the fact that people, what we're trying to do is do more integration within our own website, we've also created a widget so that from here we can actually search content from within our website and this will open up a window and take you to uh, Henry. So that being said, uh, are there any questions about the applications, about the code, uh, anything, um, how to get the code, um, anything about, you know, if you have questions about how complicated or convoluted it is or not complicated, by all means, uh, let us know. Uh, this is Eric in Cleveland. Hey, Eric. Uh, um, not really a question, just comment. It uh, looks like you did uh, a good job of covering a lot of area. Um, the um, page by page in the program book is a little awkward, but I'm sure you know that. Um, we're on. <laughs> yes, that's actually a function of content DM. Yeah. They, we host it, yeah. Yeah. We're working um, on it. Uh, uh, good luck to you. No, um, uh, we're on we're on our division, but I'm I'm assuming it's uh, you know it's just a different database, and uh, we, we are hoping by next summer that our database is uh, accurate enough that we could that we can trust it internally, and then we can think about using it externally. But, uh, well, that, I mean the way this has been designed, we I mean one of the things that we tried hard very hard to do was to to work on how we could abstract the the performance data into a format that could be uh, utilized uh, you know and, and so you know if you can take your system and extract the data in a similar data structure in the XML then it's pre a pretty seamless integration um, if, if not then there's a little bit more work you have to do on the data import to translate that into the database structure, but that's that's you know it's still not it's not necessarily rocket science as much as it is uh, a lot of detail work. Exactly. Um, and I want to just make a comment too. This is Bridget from the archives. As I recently um, was showing this at the Society of American Archivist conferences, and some of the um, people who came up were just so excited about the possibility of being able to search performance histories across different orchestras. Um, so I think some, that, was some, that was a comment I received, but I, I know yes. that. Right. <laughs> and, and one of the critical things that we wanted to try to achieve with this application was to, um, to, to develop a, a search application that would be relatively quick. I mean, if you do a very broad search, it can take a little bit of time. But we wanted to have it so that it could uh, be as quick as it could and, and, rel and, and rely more on the client's browser to do more of the parsing of, or filtering of the data. Um, and so, you know, I think we've achieved that, but, you know, obviously there's probably going to be some more fine-tuning as we go forward. But Hopefully, by virtue of what you saw today, you can see that it is, it's not, it's not terribly slow, and it's, it's, it's a pretty decent um, response in terms of searching on content and criteria. And one thing that we have done is that if you do try to do a search on a very broad term, so for example, if you really want to be um, persnickety and do a performance search on the Boston Symphony Orchestra, uh, which will return you thousands of performances, uh, the application will actually only return about 500 or the first 500 of, of that search 
and, and sort of suggest that you further reduce the, um, the search criteria. So, right, and you can do that either by using the filters or by just reperforming the search with some additional criteria. Any other questions? <laughs> All righty. Well, I appreciate you being on the call today. Um, we will be making this presentation available so that others can see it. So if, if you're speaking to anyone within your organization or if you know anybody else who wants to access this, um, by all means, have them contact us. But within the next week or so, we will have this up uh, presumably on YouTube or something to, to be available for others. And as Kristen alluded, I'll be also doing a less technical presentation uh, to the Tessitura Network in November. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right.